Thank you for taking the time to watch this video. We will provide a quick overview of our paper on the versatile uses of partial distance correlation in deep learning. Let us first unpack the title. We consider a basket of different problem settings, common vision, from learning disentangled representation to understanding what one network learns that one or more other networks do not. We show that a single concept can offer a strategy to study all these problems via a unified lens. So what is this concept? We show how the ideas of dif distance correlation and partial distance correlation, not very well studied outside the statistic, offer many useful features that has gone unnoticed in our community. Consider three models. Often we are concerned with its accuracy profile and evaluate how different models are doing in terms of their performance profile on one or more such criteria, such as sensitivity or AUC. But what if we were not interested in simply stop at accuracy? What options do we have? Well, one common approach is to perform layer by layer comparisons of the features learned by the model. This makes sense. To do so, we can simply look at their difference. Okay, but what if we are comparing two different networks and the layers do not have the same dimensionality? In this case, we are interested in capturing their correlation. Of course, for high dimensions, correlation does not work, but there is a well-known tool called CCA that can indeed be used. In fact, just a few years ago, this idea was used to evaluate representational similarity layer by layer, and it works well. Although given the efficiency issues of running CCA during training, the idea is not well used. There are stochastic versions of CCA in the shallow settings, but the deep version has only appeared very recently. The alternative we described here resolves many of these problems very easily. The idea is distance correlation. Let's review it briefly. Consider that we are given three samples. A simple intuition is that for those two samples close to each other in one domain, we want the distance between such samples in another domain to be small. And for those pairs of samples that are further apart, we want the corresponding samples in the second domain to be also far away. So we can measure the similarity between distance pairs instead of samples and see how far we can take this idea. In fact, distance correlation asks us to do exactly this. We need to compute the distance matrices between the given samples and then compute the correlation between those two distance matrices. Theoretically, if two random variables x and y are independent, then distance correlation will be zero. And if they are linearly dependent, the distance correlation will be 1. A very interesting property of distance correlation is that it does not rely on the dimension of the variables, in this case, the two-feature space. The dimension of the distance matrices only rely on the number of samples, and the dimension of the variables are allowed to be different. This is great. When the two-feature space are the same, distance correlation is, of course, well-defined. Interestingly, when the two feature space are of different dimensionality, the distance correlation is also well defined. Also, the calculation of distance correlation is also very easy if you compare it with what it may need it with CCA. Let's move to the actual use cases of distance correlation. In this paper, we cover three very different applications to show the power of distance correlation. Let's first look at the divergent training setup. If we want to improve the robustness of a given network, one idea is to train several networks and then assemble them together. We can visualize the entire possible feature spaces. A simple setup is shown in the red plot. For the first network, we may find some local minimum. And then for the second, we can also find a local minimum. And repeat and repeat. If we do not constrain between networks, we can train the networks freely. There's no guarantee that these local minimum will, will be different. In this case, even though we train five networks, we only have three unique solutions. 
But if we use distance correlation to impose that those five networks should be independent, we can have a more diverse distribution of networks. So what's the benefit? We know that we can fool one network easily using the Vasaro attacks, and it might also be easy to fool the second network. In other words, we can fool some models all the time, but it's hard to fool all the networks all the time with the same adversarial attack sample. That means by constructing an ensemble of those independent network, the overall model can be more robust. We should note that a similar strategy has been reported by others as well. Let us consider another use case, disentanglement in the latent space. For the encoder-decoder model, we can encode the input images into the latent space and then recover it back. In the latent space, we can ask that those two nodes to be independent. More precisely, we can ask that one node representing the attribute of interest, like age, and another node representing the residual information should be independent. This is called disentanglement. This recent paper is entirely focused on this specific question, and there are others. The key point of disentanglement is the independence between variables. You will see immediately that we can use distance correlation to measure the independency. In other words, if we do so, we can make sure that the latent representation are disentangled. Finally, we can also work on a novel and interesting use case condition one network on another network. What does this mean? Let's review what this means for linear regression first. What is the role of nuisance variables on the dependent variables? We know that lung cancer has an association with smoking, age, gender, and so on. But what we really care about is the relationship between smoking and lung cancer. So the age and gender are nuisance variables. So we need to control for the nuisance variables to figure out the influence of the main variables. But what if the network itself is the nuisance variable? So the question of removing the random variable becomes, what does one network learn that another one does not? This question, to our knowledge, has not been studied in this form before. Let us see how this task is carried out for linear regression. We find that random vectors of two space x and y and also the ground truth vector. We can project the vector x on y and only use the remaining vector and measure the similarity between the residual and the ground truth vector. But what if x and y are in different dimensions? We know that distance correlation can handle different dimensions easily, so we can use distance correlation quite direct in this setting. If we can project the distance matrix A onto distance matrix B and only use the residual to compute the correlation, we can answer questions of this form quite easily. This is called partial distance correlation. Bringing this discussion back to the vision space, we can ask and answer questions like, what does VIT learns that ResNet doesn't, and so on. In the main paper, we study in detail these use cases in our experiment. Here, we will briefly review some high-level results. Details are in the main paper and the supplemental documents. For the diver training, we show that our method can train more independent networks, as shown in red. Our method yields representations that are more circle-like compared with the baseline. For disentanglement, our method shows the ability to change several attributes of interest like age and gender using some semi-supervised learning labels. Finally, for network conditioning, we show that by removing ResNet from VIT, it can still learn meaningful results with respect to the heat map using GradCam. Thanks for reading the paper and viewing this video.